All right, what is going on, everybody? How is everybody doing today? Welcome back here today to another episode of the Just Ballin' Podcast. I want to apologize for not being able to upload on Monday. I had a podcast idea in mind for Monday when I was going to be away. I was in Atlanta from Sunday to Tuesday, but unfortunately, I kind of just ran out of time to record and sit down and plan that video for you guys, which is kind of going to go hand in hand with today's episode, which is going to be me ranking the last 10 um, college basketball winners and those teams directly dating back to 2014 UConn. We're going to go pretty much all the way to 2024 UConn as they beat Purdue. Uh, quick reaction to that game. I'm not going to say it was a letdown, but it was definitely not as competitive as I would have liked to see it, but that just shows the pure dominance of the 2024 UConn Huskies and this team basically steamrolled any team that they have faced in the March Madness tournament, also just dating back to last year as well. I mean, they blew out Setson, they blew out Northwestern, they blew out San Diego State and Illinois. It was somewhat close in the first half of the Alabama game, but they still ended up winning by 14 and they beat Purdue by 15 in this game. And Purdue also had a pretty good March Madness run themselves. I mean, like they blew out Grambling State, they blew out uh, Utah State, they beat Gonzaga by double digits, some fun games against Tennessee and NC State, and then they ended up losing by 15 to UConn. Um, just pure dominance of Dan um, Dan Hurley and kind of the, uh, the game planning from them. And he is arguably the best coach in college basketball i i was pretty shocking hearing that um john calipari is gonna uh go to arkansas so the kentucky job is open i don't think he's joining that and maybe scott true from baylor but this uconn team is kind of perfect for this system and the half court sets that they run it's truly like a basketball junkie's dream to watch this unfold with cam spencer and how he is good in the half court running this team offense on the ball off the ball making just split decisions um super quickly off two feet he's one of the best to do it in the country um tristan Newton, one most outstanding player still uh, a three level score for them a bucket getter their top guy offensively you have stefan castle the top draft prospect who is just a standout defender this dude is going to be in people's top five big boards including mine because of the uh, potential he has on that end of the floor as a perimeter defender you have donovan Klingon as the overall elite rim protector and then you have, you have alex caravan he didn't shoot great in this game um but he is like that slasher finisher kind of just complimentary piece to all those guys in the half court offense so yeah uh yukon ended up winning 75 60 zach ed had a monster box score game 37 and 10 he played 39 out of the 40 minutes but that's what yukon was fine with uh hurley came out and said basically their game plan was to make sure that nobody else really did anything and it was only going to be Zach Eady and that's true. Uh, Brendan Smith was the only or Brendan Smith was the only other guy with 10 plus points. He finished with 12 points but he shot 33% from the field um, and yeah it just ended up being um, the perfect game for UConn as they dominated this March Madness tournament. I still hate I mean I'm an East Coast guy. I was in Atlanta which is on the East Coast as well. Well East Coast or Eastern time zone I should say uh, not the East Coast um, and yeah this game starting at 9 30 so why is that a thing? Why is that ever a thing? I know um, it's been played or is played in Arizona, but start this game. I don't know. I don't know. I know you don't want to start at 4.30 or 5.30 in Arizona, but you maybe should, and the viewership would be a little bit better. I mean, I think they had 14, 15 million viewers, which is pretty much, it's gone down every single year since like 20, 2018, 2019. So I don't know. I, I would maybe change up the time and see if it goes back up. Maybe throw it on CBS instead of TBS. That could be um, a thing as well. But overall, it was a fun March Madness tournament. Um, that's going to be kind of the theme for today's podcast. And like I said, there was no podcast on Monday. Want to apologize for that. But um, I should be giving you guys a pod today, maybe tomorrow and Friday, or maybe I'll do Sunday, um, but you're still going to get three this week. Don't worry. Obviously, we have like kind of the NBA playoffs coming to effect um, as well with the regular season basically ending this Sunday. Yeah, like this Sunday is the last day of the regular season, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that podcast will happen. So yeah, basically going to talk about ranking from, we'll go 10 to 1, and I'm going to talk about um, my uh, ranking of the last 10 um, national champions, basically dating back to 2014. All right, so we're going to start off with 2014 UConn, the one dating furthest back. Um, this was the UConn Huskies team led by Kevin Ollie, who you may know as the uh, Brooklyn Nets current head coach. Uh, they ended up going 32 and 8 throughout the regular season. And this is back when UConn was in the American Conference with like my alma mater, Temple. Um, Cincinnati was still in here. You had Louisville, Memphis, SMU, Houston, Rutgers was in the American. I mean, yeah, the greatest transfer ever was Rutgers going to the Big Ten at the perfect time. You had UCF, you had USF in here. Um, UConn ended up going um, to the finals of the um, American tournament, but they did end up losing to Louisville by 10 points. 
Um, this was a Louisville team with like Montrezl Harrell, Russ Smith, uh, Luke Hancock, basically coming up. So some guys um, from their national championship like appearance or a championship a couple years ago. Um, prior to that, um, and, and then basically uh, they also had Terry Rozier off the bench. But yeah, we can get into this UConn team that was an underdog. I mean, they ended up going to March Madness as a seventh seed um, in the East region. So this team was led by Shabazz Napier, obviously. So Shabazz Napier ended up having a very sh brief stint in the NBA, but played himself into being a first round pick. He averaged 18 points, six rebounds, and five assists for the Huskies this year. Um, their second leading scorer was DeAndre Daniels, um, who had 13 points, six rebounds, um, and he did end up shooting 41% from three. You had Ryan Boatwright, if you remember him, um, a guard as well for them. Uh, he was pretty solid, but he was inefficient at times, but he was a good three-point shooter um, for them, and he he was a four-year player for, for UConn. They also had um, a couple other guys that really didn't stand out too much. Um, uh, they had Korma, they had uh, Giffy, they had Brima, Calhoun, a bunch of guys like I had to date back, and I was like, I forgot about this roster. I mean, I was 14 at the time, so I had to kind of refresh myself um, with this UConn team, but kind of looking at it, they weren't like, they were probably the third best team in the American going into the tournament. Like, Cincinnati was better than them, at least in conference play. Um, and if you look at net rating, you look at overall offense and defense, by far, Louisville was better than this than this UConn team. Um, so they ended up going to March Madness as a seventh seed and going on uh, a historic run. I mean, they're a couple years off of the Kemba Walker National Championship team. They ended up beating St. Jones, or excuse me, St. Joe's uh, over in Philadelphia, 89-81 in round one, 7-10 matchup. And then they upset Villanova, um, the two-seeded Villanova um, Wildcats, in the round of 32, um, that was like Ryan Archie Diakono was there. Josh Hart was, I think, a freshman at that time. They had Chris Jenkins, who obviously hit that big shot in 2016. But Shabazz Napier had 25 points in that game. Then they went on to take on Iowa State, um, and they ended up winning 81-76 in the Sweet 16. Um, this is a game, I don't think, I think they had Monty Morris over there um, in Iowa State and Matt Thomas as well, if you remember, he was in the NBA. Um, and this is a game where Ryan Boatwright had 16, DeAndre Daniels had 27, and uh, Shabazz Napier had 19. They would go on to face Michigan State. Like, they're, they were on, like, an incredible run, man. Like, nobody thought this was going to happen. Obviously, like, Kentucky was doing something great on the other side of the bracket as well. They went on to beat four seed um, Michigan State, who had um, Denzel valentine adrian payne gary harris it was a very good spartan squad big upset jabaz napier had 25 um they advanced to the final four that was the elite eight against michigan state they beat the one seed um florida gators that was re uh led by scotty wimbledon uh if you remember him that was uh yeah in the year so this is 2014 i'm like just remembering myself in ninth grade at this time um just kind of watching this all go down and how cool it was to watch jabaz napier this was more of a deandre daniels game in the final four when they ended up beating florida and then they ended up beating kentucky here um in the national championship an eight for seven matchup which was kind of cool. Like Kentucky almost won as an eight seed. Um, that was a team with like Julius Randle, James Young, and the Harrison Twins, Alex Poitras, uh, Dakari Johnson, and Shabazz Napier had 22 points. They ended up beating them 60 to 54. It was a very entertaining run. Um, I think, in my opinion, the consensus worst team out of the 10 we will talk about because if you look at the overall sample size throughout the regular season, they were not really elite offensively. They were solid defensively, but nothing crazy. Um, and they didn't even win their tournament. They weren't even the, a top two team in, your tour, in the tournament, you could say, or excuse me, in their uh, conference tournament. And we're in a two-team in conference play throughout the season. So yeah, I'm going to have um, 2014 UConn come in last. So coming in at number nine, we have 2022 Kansas uh, pretty recently. And I think all these like top nine teams are like interchangeable. I think from nine to like six, you can interchange. And then I think the top five, you could probably interchange as well. Um, but this Kansas team um, is definitely better than 2014 UConn. I think 2014 UConn is the worst team to win a national title out of the 10 we're going to talk about. So 2022 Kansas ended up going 34 and six throughout the regular season they finished as the best big 12 team um or excuse me the second best big 12 team in conference play um and then going into the the uh, big 12 tournament they ended up winning they beat texas tech so they had momentum going into the march madness tournament um they were a very very good offensive team uh the defense was average it was nothing crazy they would go on to have two first round picks in the nba they had oshay baji who was the 14th overall pick um, by the cavaliers in that 2022 draft he averaged 19 points five rebounds and ended up shooting 41 percent from three they had christian 
Brown, who had 14 points, six and a half rebounds, three assists, shot 15% from the field and 39% from three. They have Jalen Wilson as well, who is a little bit on the younger side. He ended up playing um, for the Nets this season. Um, or excuse me, yeah, at this time, yeah, he was a sophomore because he was a, a redshirted freshman. Um, and then he obviously had some COVID eligibility. So uh, he ended up playing one more year and was good for them in their junior year. They had David McCormick. They had Remy Martin, who kind of similar to Jalen Wilson, helped them in 2023 to having a successful season. Uh, Dewan Harris, uh, Mitchell Lightfoot as well. Um, um, and yeah, they had like a uh, KJ Adams on that team. So this team, um, I think, I mean, they almost lost in the national title game, but I can run through the March Madness. So they blew out Texas Southern 83-56 um, in their first game. Um, they ended up playing Creighton um, in the round of 32. Uh, this was like a young Trey Alexander who's on them now. They had Arthur Kaluma on this team, Ryan Hawkins. It was a fun Creighton team, but Kansas was much better. And I, I think a thing with this Kansas squad is nobody really likes, I mean, Oje Baji was definitely the best player, but I think they also got a ton of like involvement and I guess... It, it really just wasn't like one guy leading the show. Kind of like Shabazz Napier and DeAndre Daniels at times for UConn. Like this was pretty spread out. Remy Martin was at sometimes their best scorer in this tournament coming off the bench. They ended up beating Providence 66-61 um, in the... Um, this would be the round of 32. Um, the Sweet 16, they ended up beating 10 seed Miami. If you remember, Miami went on a run. They won 76-50 um, in that. And then this is where they kind of started to, like, to look like a legit national title team. I mean, we thought it could happen. They were at one seed. Um, but I think teams were talking, or people were talking about some other teams as well in the tournament. Um, and yeah, like blowing out Miami. And then they go and blow out Villanova in the Final Four. Because this, is, this was a very exciting Final Four because you had kind of quote-unquote blue bloods like people sometimes consider nova as a blue blood kansas definitely a blue blood and then you had unc and duke on the other bracket side um and unc was i think an eight seed i'll find out in a second um but yeah they blew out villanova this was not really a great villanova team uh but they got it done like that uh, was a game that david mccormack had a great game osha baji had a great game kind of solidifying himself as a for sure lottery pick or looking like he could be one going into the 2022 draft and then this was the national title game and i remember where i was i'm a unc fan so this one hurt a little bit um unc uh was the eight seed going into this uh kansas is a one seed i remember watching this in the vegas airport um i had a flight i had a red eye back to philly and i remember watching this whole game in the vegas airport man and unc looked so good they were up by 15 at the half 40 to 25 and then kansas outscores them 47 to 29 in the second half uh, it was crazy like rj uh davis shot the ball horribly same with Armando baycott same with kale Blove. it was kind of disgusting um and this was a consistent game in the second half from christian brown who had a great all-around game he had a double double oshek baji at 12 points jalen wilson at 15 remy martin at 14 mccormack at 15 and it, this was a very well-rounded kansas team on both ends of the floor i think you could have them maybe it's like like i said maybe six would be the absolute peak but I don't think that this team is as kind of well-rounded as some of these other teams and is a little bit more recent as well. So they're going to come in at number nine for me. All right, so coming in at number eight, we have 2019 Virginia. Um, this could be low for sure. Um, I don't think... I think this may be a little bit subjective on my part having this team low, but they are a damn good team. And I think like Kansas, you could have them as high as six, maybe, maybe as high as five, but I'm going to have them here because I think if you stack them up against the rest of these teams... Like, this was a great team, but I think if you stack them up against the rest of these teams, they don't really hold their own as much. I mean, they were a phenomenal defensive team. You could say that they were the best defensive team in all of college basketball this season. I mean, that's been a staple under head coach Tony Bennett. Um, and then their offense was pretty, like, average. Uh, that's why I think they, like, I would worry about them against some maybe other teams throughout this. They were the best team um, in the ACC this season, basically. Them and UNC, I think they finished possibly second I think second in conference play, um, but they ended up not even, uh, they lost in the semifinals of the uh, ACC tournament. They ended up losing to Florida State, um, and then Duke beat UNC in the semifinals, and then Duke ended up beating Florida State um, in the uh, the ACC championship game. Um, but yeah, like I said, this Virginia team was phenomenal defensively, uh, has like a 2K legend. They had uh, Kyle Guy is basically their top guy no pun intended um he was an elite three-point shooter shot 43 percent from downtown he was a solid rebounder average 15 and a half points for them they would go on to have the fourth overall pick in the 2019 draft deandre hunter 15 points five rebounds shot 52 percent from the field 44 percent from three uh funny enough i actually watched the hawks game when i was in Atlanta, and deandre hunter went off against the miami heat uh they had um first round pick uh ty jerome as well 13 and a half points five and a half assists if i remember ty jerome was a first round pick uh late first round yeah 24th in the 2019 draft i was like wait was he an early second 
They had a uh, Mamade, uh, like, I, I always mispronounce his name, so I don't want to really say it again to mispronounce it. They had Braxton Key, um, and they had Jay Hoff, Jack Salt, and those guys as well. But this was pretty much led by Jerome Hunter and Kyle Guy, and it was a great trio because um, Jerome was really the facilitator. Um, kind of Kyle Guy was the connector piece, and he could set guys up as well, but also create his own shot. And DeAndre Hunter was obviously somebody that could space the floor, but also had a great inside touch. Um, as well so yeah like this this virginia team basically went on they they blew out their 16th matchup against gardner webb they won 71 56 they would go on to face oklahoma the ninth seed here um they ended up beating them 63 51 uh this was pretty much led by virginia it wasn't like a late comeback or anything in that um that oklahoma team really wasn't all that good either um and they ended up advancing to the so the Sweet 16, they were going to face Oregon um, in 2019. Um, this Oregon team did have Peyton Pritchard. They had Lewis King. They had Paul White. They they were solid, Will Richardson as well. Um, but Virginia ended up kind of getting past them. And they were just basically doing what Virginia did, keeping the score low throughout the first three games, playing good defense, and really not, nothing crazy on the offensive end. Then it was a crazy game against Purdue. Um, kind of this point on, people will always say that Vir or Virginia kind of got a little bit lucky. There were some favorable calls to them down the stretch in their final three games. Uh, in the Elite Eight, they beat Purdue 80 to 75. Um, this was, Zach Eady wasn't on this team yet, um, unless he was redshirted this year, but I don't think he was. Um, but this was Carson Edwards, who was just a bucket at Purdue. Uh, he had 42 points in this game. He carried this team, he had 10 threes. Um, but Virginia, hey, for a team that wasn't great offensively and known for their defense, they got it done on the offensive end when they needed to. Um, they ended up, uh, this game going to overtime as well. Ty Jerome had a great game. Um, yeah, kind of ish. Like he wasn't efficient, but he still put up 24 and seven. Kyle Guy, he had 25 and 10. Um, and this was like, okay, Virginia has made it to the final four. They're slowing the game down, but like even when they're picking it up the pace a little bit and going to overtime, um, they were able to get it done. They beat them um, by five there um, in a game that was pretty much close throughout the whole game too. It wasn't really like a, like a comeback in the second half at all. Um, and then they would go on to face Auburn in the final four. This was an Auburn team that came off beating unc um as well where i thought unc was kind of going to go all the way that year um this auburn team um was honestly nothing too crazy i think they um they did have chumo kk who got hurt which was a big loss for them as well um they were led by like bryce brown and jared harper um but yeah ty jerome kind of stepped up in this game uh he had 21 points kyle guy 15 deandre 114 and then they would go on and face texas tech um in a weird national championship game i think people were like interesting matchup between these two teams uh texas tech was led by jared culver who ended up being the sixth overall pick in the 2019 draft um and virginia ended up winning um 85 77 uh this was like a tournament for kyle guy deandre hunter and ty jerome and like i said that was like the staple three and out of anybody on this list they're probably like the second best defensive team maybe the first like we'll get to um 2021 baylor in a little bit um i think that the 2021 baylor 2019 virginia definitely the two best defensive teams and if you look at like defensive analytics um and statistics um it, it will say 2019 virginia is probably the best defensive team um out of anybody that I, out of any team i talk about here but i just think the lack of offense somewhat the lack of depth and I think like at least some inefficiencies from their top guys. I would worry about Virginia against some of these other teams. So I'm having them at eight. You could have them higher. Uh, I really wouldn't complain there because of how good their defense was. All right, so coming in at number seven, we have 2017 UNC. Oh man, so this was like my peak, I would guess UNC fandom. I think the year prior in 2016, uh, and they had the heartbreaking loss against Villanova, who we'll get to eventually. And yeah, um, I, I became a UNC fan personally around like the Ty Lawson, Tyler Hansborough era. Um, it was weird kind of throughout the early 2010s. I mean, they had some really good teams, don't get me wrong. And I really thought they were going to win it in 2012 with like uh, Tyler Zeller, John Henson, Kendall Marshall, Harrison Barnes. Like that was definitely their year. They lost to Kansas. Um, and that Kansas team was led by Thomas Robinson. And then they kind of were physical, like had some disappointing exits. Um, 2016, they lost. But in 2017, they came right back and they were able to win it. Um, they ended up finishing um, first in the ACC. Um, in the ACC um, tournament, they ended up um, kind of being disappointing. Like they lost by 10 to Duke um, in the semifinals. Duke ended up beating Notre Dame um, in the ACC championship. Uh, this is one of Roy Williams' like final years. Like obviously uh, he played a couple more or coached a couple more after this. This team was very good offensively they were definitely respectable defensively um and it, it was a it was a fun 2017 team because they had unfinished business some of these guys from the 2016 season like justin jackson um kind of came back and had a, a much larger role after guys like bryce johnson and marcus page left the year prior um and jackson 
was a beast, man. He he was an elite three-point shooter. I'm surprised he really didn't work out in the NBA. Um, maybe it was his jumper. Maybe it was his like lack of quickness off the ball. But he was a stud. He finished with 18 points, five rebounds. He shot 37% um, from three. They Joel Berry kind of breaking out as that point guard for that, uh, that team. He finished with 14 and a half points and shot 38% from three. You had Kennedy Meeks and Isaiah Hicks inside. One of the better um front court kind of duos that you could have had they tony bradley who i think like surprisingly declared for the draft um and he ended up getting drafted still fairly high but i thought he was going to stay another year they had kenny williams and theo pinson for their defensive ability they had luke may who obviously like everybody knows that that big shot against kentucky in march madness they had nate Britt. um the seventh woods just did not work out as a recruit but this unc team it was good um they were a one seed in the south region they beat uh, they blew out texas southern in round one um they beat arkansas by seven and then I'm like watching then i'm like oh like this was kind of close i did not love um maybe that round of 32 matchup for them um and then i was like all right how far are they really gonna go um but yeah they ended up beating them uh 72 65 and they beat butler um 92 80 in a very fun game against the uh, i think butler was the four seed um going into this march madness tournament yeah they were the four seed um, this was a great game from Joel Berry and Justin Jackson combined for 50. And then Luke May started to hit his shots off the bench. And you're like, all right, maybe they have a little bit of depth. They have somebody in there. And then there was the 1-2 matchup in the Elite Eight against Kentucky, man. It, it, this was like one of the best uh, March Madness games, I think, of the last 10 years as well. Um, just Malik Monk hitting that game tying three and then Luke May winning it. And that Kentucky team was really good. Like looking back, like Isaiah Briscoe, Malik Monk, De'Aaron Fox, and Bam Adebayo. It was a good Kentucky squad for sure. That's a team that could have won the championship. Um, but Luke May, man, 17 points off the bench and hitting one of the biggest shots in, I think, Tar Heel history. Like, not the biggest, um, but up there, man. They ended up beating Dylan Brooks, um, Jordan Bell, um, Tyler Dorsey, Peyton Pritchard again here in the in the Final Four. Um, Peyton Pritchard had a very successful Oregon career for sure. Um, but yeah, like Kennedy Meeks at 25 just dominated inside um, and just was too physical for, for Jordan Bell at the time. And then 22 from Justin Jackson, 11 for Joel Berry. And they would go to face Gonzaga in the national championship. They won 71-65, which I feel like when I was watching it, I feel like it was never that close. Um, but it was at times. And then um, they ended up winning by six. UNC finishes the unfinished business. I was upset that Marcus Page or Bryce Johnson couldn't get a ring. Um, but they ended up getting one at least with somewhat of that 2016 core. So I do have UNC coming in at number seven. Um, I think they had a pretty deep roster compared to some of the teams I've talked about before. Um, at, at least with 2014 UConn and 2019 Virginia specifically. Um, and I don't think... You could maybe have them. No, I don't know. I I'm not going to really say it. you can have them in the top six. I think seven is probably their peak. All right. So coming in at number six, we have 2016 Villanova. And as somebody that wasn't really a huge, like overall college basketball fan and didn't appreciate what this team was at the time and really only cared about UNC, this team like broke my heart, man. I was in 11th grade. I remember where I was watching this team and them beating UNC, which we'll get to in a little bit in the national championship game. But they finished um, first pretty much in the Big East at the end of the year they were sixth in the ap poll they ended up being a two seed um in the in the tournament um they ended up losing in the big east now so now like nova yeah big east now uh they ended up losing to scene hall in the big east championship in a very good game too looking back on it that was like a scene hall team with isaiah whitehead on that squad um and nova ended up having a good roster that year honestly it wasn't like the sexiest on paper but you had josh hart Chris Jenkins, Ryan Archie Diacono, uh, Daniel Chafu. You had a younger Jalen Brunson. Obviously, Brunson comes into his own in that 2018 Nova team, which we'll get to later. They had Phil Booth, young Mikel Bridges as well, young Dante DiVincenzo. Overall talent, this team is stacked. At the time, though, um, they had plenty of depth, but like obviously Bridges, Booth, Brunson, DiVincenzo all became much more impactful guys in um in 2018 um so basically yeah this team ended up being a two seed they blow out unc Asheville. i was actually at this game i remember at the barclay center um back in in 2016 um i watched them and unc Asheville, and then i watched temple iowa and i remember like not even thinking i was going to temple and i was rooting for iowa because i had them in my tournament that was when jared utah hit like a game winner against temple funny enough um but yeah they they blow out unc Asheville at the barclays they go on to take on iowa so they would have faced temple which would have been cool like kind of a, a philly matchup there but yeah they had peter jock on that iowa team um and this was a team um that just kind of like just was good on both ends of the floor man like they were a good offensive team they were a good defensive team they could shoot the ball they could all kind of switch on the defensive end of the floor they can both run in transition um they beat miami um they blew them out basically like this 2016 nova was really good most of their tournament games outside of the elite eight and championship game 
were blowouts. Um, they ended up beating number one Kansas in the Elite Eight um, in a very good game. They ended up winning 64-59. Um, that was a Kansas team that had Frank Mason, Wayne Selden, Devontae Graham, Perry Ellis, the guy that spent like 10 years in college. They'd seen McCayuk as well. Um, that was a game that was just like Josh Hart, typical, 13 points. Archie Dakano, 13 points. Daniel Chafu, 10 points, eight rebounds. Um, Chris Jenkins, 13 points, four rebounds, three assists. Um, I just hate saying that name, Chris Jenkins, man, because he just destroyed my childhood for sure. Um, then they blow out Oklahoma, um, and this was the Buddy Heald Oklahoma team as well, that everyone was like, whoa, like shocked that this happened. Buddy Heald in this game, they held him to nine points. He shot um, he shot four for 12 from the field, um, and this was a great game from Josh Hart, who was solidifying himself as a first round pick. I'm surprised um, he didn't actually go into the 2016 draft, and he decided to kind of stay another year um, and go in to the 2017 draft um and then kind of looking back on 2017 nova i'm surprised like yeah they went 32 and 4 i'm surprised they had a real chance at three-peating but they lost to wisconsin in the round of 32 like i, I just like didn't look into that because they didn't win the 2017 title but wow i was kind of shocked that happened um yeah nigel hayes man uh, bronson cohen wow i forgot about him as well um but yeah they ended up blowing out oklahoma in the um, in the final four game. And then they go up against UNC because that 2016 UNC team was so, so good. Like this was a collision course for two giants because like UNC beat FGCU in round one. They blew out Providence. They blew out Indiana. They blew out Notre Dame. They blew out Syracuse. That was like the Malachi Richardson one. Um, so they blew out every single opponent. They didn't face anybody in the top four though until they got to Nova in the final game. And they lost 77-74 in one of the greatest college basketball championship games we have ever seen. Um, this was, was obviously known for such a competitive game going back and forth. Um, UNC was up by five at the end of the first half. Towards the end of the game, Villanova starting to pull away. They're down by um, three. Marcus Page double clutch three to tie the game, which could have been one of the greatest shots in college basketball history if it was for the win, or even if it just sent it to overtime and UNC ended up winning. But then Chris Jenkins, the trailer, the guy who inbounded the ball, hits the game-winning three, and 2016 Nova ends up winning the championship in absolute heartbreaking fashion. I just remember where I was, and I was just like, I fell to my knees, and I was so upset. Um, like, Phil Booth had 20 points in this game, and there was really kind of developing this core of what was going to be like future Villanova guys um, kind of win, like, um, Archie Nakano was going to be done, and Ochefu, and like, this team was so good, like, look, looking back on it um, on both ends of the floor. You could have 2016 Nova higher. I personally like the 2018 one a little bit more, and we're going to have them in a little bit, um, but yeah, like, they beat a very good 2016 UNT team with Joel Berry, Marcus Page, Justin Jackson, Bryce Johnson, Kennedy Meeks, Isaiah Hicks, Theo Pinson, Nate Britt, <laughs> Joel James as the backup center yeah 2016 nova is really good i don't think you can have them any lower but you could definitely have them higher all right so kicking off the top five i have 2023 UConn. So uh, the second most recent team here we're going to talk about. And yeah, I'm going to have UConn pretty much starting off the top five. This was a team that was a four seed in March Madness um, in the Big East. Uh, last year, they ended up um, losing in the Big East semifinals to Marquette um, in a really good game. They lost 70 to 68. Marquette ended up beating Xavier in the championship. They went 31 and eight throughout the regular season, but they were a very well-balanced team. This was a good offensive team. This was a good defensive team. Um, their preseason odds to win the championship are plus 8,000. So um, um, yeah, nobody really expected them to do much. I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen the Dan Early video of them like kind of hitting rock bottom as a team. I think it was in 2020 and they're like, look out for us. We're coming. Don't worry. And this team came here. It, re it really did in 2020, um, in 2023, pause there. I know. Uh, but like just Adema Sonogo as just like the bruiser inside presence, 17 points, eight rebounds that year. Good efficiency. Could even knock down a three or two. Jordan Hawkins, like elite three and d guy this is a championship caliber player i don't think like i'm gonna look up right now jordan hawkins was he no he was a sophomore wow imagine hawkins stayed for his junior year this year could have been crazy like tristan newton coming into his own and then obviously led the team this year you had uh, a year younger Alex Caravan and Donovan Klingon. You had the defensive presence of Andre Jackson, who ended up being um, a good second round pick for the Bucks and a good defender as well. Um, and this team was a four seed, but me, like I was high on this team. I had them win my national championship last year um, and I loved watching them. And I was like, this is a really good team that could make a run. They had kind of a nice tournament or uh, region bracket as well. They were the four seed in the West region. They beat Iona 87-63. Um, and it was funny enough, like that was still Rick Pitino, comes over to St. John's in the big East. Um, they beat St. Mary's 70 to 55 in the round of 30, uh, round of 32. They blew out Arkansas in the um, Sweet 16, and then I'm like the eight seeded Arkansas Razorbacks, and I'm like, okay, 
this team might be legit. Like that was like a statement win. Um, and that was like with Anthony Black, Ricky Council, Nick Smith, Jordan Walsh. It was a respectable Arkansas team. And then they go up against Gonzaga who beat UCLA um, in the Sweet 16. And then they blow the doors off Gonzaga 82-54 um, in a just like, holy crap, eye-opening game. Like Jordan Hawkins was legit. Sonogo and Caravan, like legit as well as complimentary pieces. They beat five seed in Miami. Like this was a weird Final Four because um, you had San Diego State, FAU, Miami, and UConn. Like it was a weird tournament. Um, they ended up beating Miami by 13, 72-59. Um, a team with like Isaiah Wong on that team. It was, it was a fun Miami team, um, but they obviously regressed a lot in 2024. Sonogo just kind of continued as the number one guy for them as well. And then they beat San Diego State 76-59 uh, in a lackluster national championship game, but pure dominance, March Madness run. Um, did they ever go up against the two-seed or one-seed? No, but they did blow out three-seeded Gonzaga. They did. Um, and then, yeah, they like ended up winning by 14, 15, um, 20, 23, um, 18, 13, and then 17. Like pure dominance, the margin of victory in the tournament. And I don't think they were a great regular season team. Um, I don't think they were anything special, but the pure dominance in March Madness tournament makes me put them at five. If you wanted to drop them below 2016 Nova, I'm cool with that 100%. But I think that they were just also well balanced like Nova. And I think like just having the inside presence as well of Donovan Klingon and the mind of Dan Hurley, who you could say now is a better coach than Jay Wright. And that would be a masterpiece to watch between those two teams for sure. But I don't think you could drop them any more than six. And I think 2016 Nova can maybe go to five and that's really it. All right, coming in at number four, um, I got 2015 Duke. Um, this team obviously loaded with NBA talent um, that ended up going. Uh, Julio Okafor ended up being the third overall pick in the draft. You had Quinn Cook that played pretty important games in the NBA. You had Justice Winslow, another lottery pick. Tyus Jones, a first round pick. You had a very young Grayson Allen on this team as well. You had Emil Jefferson. Um, and it's funny, like Grayson Allen like ended up being better than Justice Winslow and Juvial Okafor in the NBA, funny enough. They ended up going 35-4 and four, um, throughout the regular season. Um, they finished second in the ACC, um, in the ACC tournament. Um, they ended up losing to Notre Dame in the semis. Um, and Notre Dame ended up beating UNC in the finals in kind of like a weird game. And that was a team that had, um, was that Bonzi Colson? No, it was Pat Connaughton. It was Jerry and Grant, Demetrius Jackson. Um, no, it did have Bonzi Colson, but he was kind of coming off the bench. He was a little bit younger. So um, they ended up going to the tournament as a one seed in the South region. They blew out Robert Morris in round one. Um, they uh, ended up winning by 29 points. Points. Um, they were a very good offensive team, this Duke team, but they weren't they weren't terrible defensively, but they weren't anything special. I think they were definitely beatable. I think there was some mismatch you could get on Okafor. He wasn't like this elite rim protector in college by any means, but he was still like respectable for sure. Uh, they ended up beating San Diego State, but and, and this was a great defensive game for them. They ended up winning 68-49, and you're like, okay, that's an impressive defensive game from Duke. Um, and like this team had depth. Like you also had Marshall Plumley who got notable minutes, Matt Jones, who got notable minutes on this team. Um, and then they ended up playing Utah and they won 63-57. It was a close game with DeLon Wright and Yaka Pertle, who obviously ended up playing um, pretty good careers in the NBA. Also, very young Kyle Kuzma on this team. Uh, he ended up being more important in 16 and 17, and he was in that 2017 draft. But this was a great tournament for Winslow on both ends of the floor. And I think I see a lot of like Justice Winslow and Stephon Castle's game. And I think that's going to be a big thing for Castle if he develops that shot. And that's going to be a thing, I think, as we evaluate him as a 2024 draft prospect. Um, they ended up beating um, Gonzaga in the in the Elite Eight, 66-52. Uh, Gonzaga had like Kyle Wilcher, like an absolute sharpshooter. He was a fun player to watch. I had a younger DeMontis Sabonis as well. Um, and yeah, another good game from Winslow, um, at least on the defensive end of the floor, from what I remember. Matt Jones was kind of just like becoming a sharpshooter for this team. Um, and then they also got some um, like, a little bit of playoff grace and Allen, but obviously not a ton. Then they beat Michigan State by 20, 81-61 in the Final Four, um, which was kind of a letdown game because it was a good Michigan State team, but I think they've had better teams in the past. Um, they had like Brent Forbes, Enzo Valentine, Travis Trice, uh, Brandon Dawson as well. Um, but Duke, man, like the big three, or I guess the big four at this time with Ty Jones, Quinn Cook, Joel Gafford, and Justice Winslow were unmatched. And then this game was kind of a breakout game a little bit for Grayson Allen off the bench, just playing more notable minutes. And then we kind of got robbed of a 2015 um, uh, Duke-Kentucky game because Kentucky ended up losing 71-64 in that um, Final Four game to Wisconsin. And that 2015 Kentucky team ended up going 38-0 uh, up until that game, and they ended up losing... Um, they ended up losing um, that game to be their only loss of the year. That team had Cat, Booker, Harrison Twins, Coley Stein, Trey Lyles, Tyler Uless. If I was grading like best teams, 
I, I 2015 Kentucky, I, in my opinion, would be better, better than 2015 Duke. But 2015 Duke ended up getting it done. They ended up beating Wisconsin 68-63 um, in the finals. That Kentucky or that Wisconsin team had Frank the Tank, uh, Kaminsky, they had Nigel Hayes, Josh Gasser, Sam Decker. Um, it was a good team. It was. Um, but Duke got it done. And that was a Grayson Allen National Championship game where he had 16 points in 21 minutes, which basically started his long career as Duke to being one of the more hated players in college basketball, but one of the best players in Duke history as well. So I do have 2015. 15 Duke. Um, they had deep, like a deep team. They had good enough defense on the perimeter. They had a good lead guard in Tyus Jones, and obviously dominant back to the basket center in Jubil Okafor. Um, I think I would not put him in the top three. I think my top three is pretty much standard. Um, but I don't think um, I don't think you could drop them lower than six. But if you wanted to say 2023 UConn would beat them, 2016 Nova. Maybe 2017 UNC, but I don't think so. Um, I think it's really just 23 UConn or 2016 Nova. So let's get into the top three. Where this could be a little bit of a hot take, but I'm going to have 2021 Baylor. I think a lot of people love this team. I loved the 2021 Gonzaga team. They played as well. Unfortunately, Gonzaga did not go undefeated. They were 31-0 and going to Baylor in that national championship game, and then they got blown out by Baylor. It was a little bit of a shorter season as well because of COVID. Um, and then this was the first tournament we got since 2019 Virginia because we didn't have a tournament um, in 2020. Uh, they finished first in the Big 12 Baylor that season. Um, they ended up losing the semifinals. I feel like it's kind of a trend. Yeah, like a lot of these teams that win March Madness do not really win their conference tournament. <laughs> Unless you're UConn maybe on some occasions. Um, but yeah, 2021 Baylor was an elite defensive team. They really were. Um, they were like, I don't think as good as 2019 Virginia, but they were still really good. And they were a good offensive team as well. They were probably even better offensive team. Um, I think a lot of them or a lot of you guys may say that 2021 Baylor is better than you can probably figure out who the top two are. Um, this was led by two future like NBA players in uh, Davion Mitchell, elite perimeter defensive guard. Same with Jared Butler, who's probably the best player on this team. They had Macy Oteague as well, who was like a phenomenal shooter. If you like remember, his jumper form looked disgusting. He actually started at UNC Asheville, um, ended up getting like um, redshirted as a like transfer to Baylor because that was when you had to sit out a year when you transferred. I wonder if like the NCAA is going to go back to that. Um, but he was like the second winning scorer. You had Adam Flagger, you had Matthew Mayer. These guys were big parts of their 2022 um, team as well when they got upset by UNC. Um, they'd flow Thamba as well. LJ Cryer, if you remember him, because he's currently on Houston, um, he ended up starting his career at Baylor. It's crazy. Some of these guys are still going to be going into like their fifth year because of the extra year of eligibility. It was a weird year as well for this tournament because they didn't have fans really. So um, at least for some part of it. And I wonder if that could dock them. Like would Baylor have won it all if there were fans? I don't know. I'm not going to say that because this team was really good. They blew out Hartford in um, the round of 64, 79 55 they were one seed in the south region then they beat wisconsin uh 76 63 in the round of 32 they beat Vill villanova who was a fifth seed in the sweet 16 62 51 um that nova team was okay they had jermaine samuels they had jermaine robinson earl um i think this is what the 2021 season um no no i was like oh it was sadiq bay there and like hurt now he wasn't there because he was in the 2020 draft then they beat arkansas 81 72 in the elite eight a very good arkansas team um with moses moody Devontae davis they had uh jay will jalen williams not jay dub but jay will was on that team and then like teague butler and mitchell like that was an insane trio and they had at least some bench as well uh, with flagger and uh meyer um and then they beat houston um, in the final four, 78-59. And then they were basically on a collision course with uh, Gonzaga. That Houston team had like Quentin Grimes. Um, they had Marcus Sasser, Jamal Sheed, who's obviously like the best player on that team, on that Houston team currently. Um, but yeah, it was pretty much a great run from that trio um, of Teague, Butler, and Mitchell. And then I really thought Gonzaga was going to have the undefeated season. That Gonzaga team had Andrew Nemhard, who's on the Pacers, uh, Corey Kispert on the Wizards, Jalen Suggs on the Magic, Drew Timmy, Who's, I, don't, I don't even know where Drew Timmy's playing, but obviously he was like a great college player. Joel Yai, who I thought was a pretty creative scoring wing. Anton Watson, Julian Strother, a young Strother who is on um, Denver right now. And they ended up losing, man. Like Baylor hit their shots. They were not missing from three whatsoever. Like this team um, had a phenomenal shooting game. Um, ended up like just... Jared Butler went four for nine from downtown. Adam Flagger went three for four. Um, um, Massey Oteague went two for three. And they ended up winning. I, I don't know if I think like this team could be as physical with some of the top two teams, um, at least inside um, the paint. Um, I don't, I think they lack maybe that like elite big. But you know what? Honestly, I don't think I, I maybe I just don't latch onto that 2021 Baylor team as much to put them in the top two. You could, and you could probably give me a good argument why. But I think... You could probably drop them all the way down to five, and I'd be fine with that. I think any lower, I wouldn't say so, because this team was good on both ends of the floor, and their perimeter defense 
is as elite as it came and they were a really good shooting and they had depth as well which i think plays a huge role but i think it's really interesting to how to rank up like 2021 baylor 2015 duke 2023 yukon 2016 nova and 2017 unc because those could all be kind of interchangeable and that's what makes this kind of challenge or exercise kind of challenging so let's get into the top two and at number two we are gonna have 2024 UConn. I'm not going to go with them number one. I'm going to have them number two. I thought maybe I was going to have them number one because this team was kind of so dominant throughout the year. Um, like talking about them earlier with Tristan Newton as like the three level scorer and the winning most outstanding player. Cam Spencer as kind of the lead floor general for this team and just such a high basketball IQ. Alex Caravan as the shooter, slasher, cutter. Donovan Klingon as the physical inside presence. Castle as a slasher and cutter, but also an elite perimeter defender as well. And this team just dominating kind of March Madness this year. Like they've also seen Hall and like Creighton at times throughout the regular season, but they ended up finishing first in the Big East. They won the Big East tournament, blowing out Marquette in that um in that championship game after kind of getting by St. John's in the semifinals. They were a elite defensive team, um, a pretty elite offensive team as well. Um, and this team just had a really good starting lineup. They didn't really get injured too much. Like obviously you guys had their injuries, but they were pretty much healthy towards the end of the stretch and just a dominant tournament run, blowing out Stetson, Northwestern, um, a rematch from last year, San Diego State, blowing them out by 30, going on a 30 to zero run against Illinois in the Elite Eight, beating Bama by 14, and then beating number one Purdue by 15 in the national championship. Pure resume, what they did in the regular season, in their conference tournament, conference play, um, and then the March Madness tournament, this is as good as you could possibly get. But I'm kind of ranking these, like matching these guys up against other teams as well and taking that into account. And um, I don't know, it, it really comes down to like how like, I don't know because like if they first like an elite defensive team and they obviously never we never got to see them play houston we didn't even get to see them play like unc it would have been i think a little bit more entertaining if we did um maybe there was somewhat down games but not really a ton honestly um because we we also missed out on that auburn matchup as well because auburn lost to yale in um the round of 64. i don't know though i have them at number two i also don't want to be too like recency biased not getting in my head and this is the most recent like national title team so i have them at two but if you put them at one i'm okay with that i don't think you can have them any lower than three they're definitely a top three team like i said elite on both ends of the floor elite in the regular season elite in their conference tournament elite in the march madness tournament it's an overall perfect season for the yukon huskies who just got their sixth ring but to finish us off i'm gonna go with 2018 villanova uh this team went 36 in uh four throughout the regular season they were the one seed in the east region for march madness they finished as the two kind of seed uh standing wise in the Big East this year behind Xavier. They ended up winning though their conference tournament. Um, they beat Providence by double digits. They blew up Butler in the semifinals. Um, they blew up Marquette um, in that Thursday matchup as well. So they kind of never really played a close conference championship game um, because they were just that good overall. And I think they were a better version of that 2016 team. Uh, some guys left, obviously no more Ochefu, no more Josh Hart on this team, no more Chris Jenkins, but Jalen Brunson coming into his own, winning most outstanding player that year. Um, in the in all of college basketball winning or having Mikel Bridges as an elite three and D guy for this team but also a great score Dante DiVincenzo as a beautiful complimentary piece of those two Amari Spellman and Eric Pascal inside Phil Booth um towards the end of his college career still being contributing on this team um Colin Gillespie as well off the bench like a younger version of him um and Jermaine Samuels as well like this Nova team in 2018 was so so good um and they pretty much blew out any any team they faced in the tournament like UConn this year. So I don't think you can say UConn has that over them. They were, in my opinion, the best offensive team in all of college basketball. And they were pretty good defensively as well. They weren't like as elite as some of these other teams, like some of these UConn or Virginia teams, but they were pretty damn good, in my opinion, on the defensive end of the floor. Um, in the first round, they blew out Radford as uh, the 16th seed. In round two, they versed 19 Alabama, blew them out as well. Um, that was an Alabama team with Colin Sexton and Braxton Key, and Herb Jones was on that team as well, um, a younger Herb Jones. Then they versed five seeded uh, Virginia. They blew them out 90 to 78. Like this team could score in so many different ways. That Virginia team had Javon Carter on it. Um, but Jalen Brunson, man, like we're seeing him do it for the Knicks in real life. He was doing it in this March Madness tournament. And as somebody that was so high um, on Kansas, like we, we'll get to that in Michigan as well. Um, I think this was the year of the Loyola uh, Sister Jean year um, in the 
uh, in the Elite Eight, um, they ended up blowing out Texas Tech by 12. Uh, that had a Jared Culver, um, who didn't really uh, blossom yet, but they had uh, Zaire Smith. I mean, Culver was good for that team, but obviously he was a little bit better in 2019. Um, and then they ended up blowing out Kansas. Like, that was like, all right, this team, no one's stopping Nova. Like, blowing out Kansas by 16, because that Kansas team was so good. It really was. Uh, with Graham and Newman and with Gerald Vick and Svima Kayuk and Yudoka Azabuki. It was a very good team. Um, and then, like, beating them 95-79, they were scoring... 90 left and right. I mean, like 87, 81, 90, 71, 95 points in every game up to this point. Um, and Eric Pascal, like just so efficient inside in the tournament as well. DiVincenzo off the bench. And then they ended up going up against Michigan. Could Michigan too, um, as a three seed. Um, obviously, Michigan, I think, got a little lucky facing probably uh, Loyola, Maryland or Loyola, Loyola Illinois. Um, not Maryland. Why did I say Maryland? Because that's the Cam Spencer Loyola, Maryland. No. Yeah, uh, either way, that's why I said it. But Loyola Chicago um, in the Final Four, um, and then they lost to them in the National Championship game, losing to Nova um, in a game um, that was just not really close, 79-62. Um, at the end of the first half, it was 37-28. Um, that was a team with Mo Wagner, Isaiah Livers, Duncan Robinson, Jordan Poole. Um, but they were a little bit younger coming off the bench um, as well. Um, but just Nova, man. Like 31 points for DiVincenzo. That was the DiVincenzo game. Mikel Bridges had a phenomenal game. And I think top to bottom, like you take into account, like obviously a lot of these teams, amazing coaches, Bill Self, um, Tony Bennett, Coach K, Roy Williams, uh, Kevin Ollie, Dan Early, um, or uh, yeah, Dan Early, um, Scott True, like all elite coaches, obviously. That's usually what happens. You win a national championship with an elite coach, but you had Jay Wright, you had the best offensive team in the country. You had a good enough defense with switchability, and we know how good like some of these guys are defensively in the NBA as well, but at college, they were so, so good. They had the depth, they had the bench. I do think 2018 Nova is the best college team of the last 10 years. Um, I think it's a debate between 2018 Nova, 2024 UConn, and 2021 Baylor. Um, I still really like 2023 UConn, 2015 Duke, and 2016 Nova as well. Um, but yeah, that is going to wrap up this pod. I hope you guys did enjoy that. Maybe it went a little bit longer than I thought, but I had kind of so much fun uh, digging through that, going from the past, and just talking about those two, uh, 10 teams. Um, if you guys disagree with anything I said or you agree, let me know in the comments on YouTube if you're watching there. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I would really appreciate a rating and review over there. It maybe takes two seconds or just follow. That means a ton as well. Like I said, you guys will definitely be getting still three podcast episodes this week. Definitely one on Friday. Um, either if you don't see one tomorrow, there'll be one on Saturday or Sunday. Um, but if not, uh, or if so, you'll see one tomorrow and then definitely one on Friday. So thank you guys all for watching and listening. Love you guys. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.